you know, you hear over the radio, we're taking fire, we're under fire. We're under fire. And you hear the pleading in their voices you can hear that. that they need help bad. I actually dropped to a knee and then I got I'm like, why the hell did I do that? And that's when the rocket hit. Roan had a machine gun and he started laying down hate. I rolled him over. There was no response. I ripped off his body armor, took a pulse, couldn't feel nothing. When you realize they're dead, what do you do? I just kind of said a prayer over each, both of them. I grew up out on the farm, rode horses as much as I could, um, and worked with cattle. My mom had a book that asked what your career would be or what you wanted to grow up to be, and mine was always either a police officer, a firefighter, or um, a soldier. It was December of 1983 when I actually signed up. I wanted to be in the infantry because that's where you get to do all the fun stuff. When I got out of the military, I started uh, working as a police officer. And then after that, I uh, picked up a job as chief of police in a small town and then moved on to contracting after that. Well, I got to Benghazi and I was gonna be there for 60 days. That was my first time into uh, Libya. I remember walking through our, our university and there was an army recruiter and he picked me out of a crowd and he said, hey, what are you, what are you gonna do after college? He showed me a Ranger video, and I asked him, I said, is that, is that looks pretty tough, is it hard? And he said, man, that's, you gotta be pretty tough to get in it. That's what I wanna do. If a lot of people can't do it, I wanna do that. In 2003, I was medically discharged, and out of the blue, I got a call from Blackwater. They were just starting, saying, hey, uh, we're looking for contractors to go to Iraq. And I said, yes. I got the call to go Olivia was early, early uh, 2012. Did he help you? Third grade. That's that's when we lived across the street from the uh, recruiting station. I mean, it just kind of kept going there. I chose the Marine Corps because I always hear they're always the toughest guys, so that's, I tried out for the toughest one I could find. Got out actually about two months before I got totally bored. I had to go find work. I ended up going getting a job in heating and air conditioning. That's, I did that until I got into contracting. <laughs> The first time that I actually went there to uh, Libya, we, uh, I went into Tripoli. That was my first trip. And then the second time I went back, and the third time, the fourth time, they're all in Benghazi. This attack lasted 13 hours. Uh, four people died, including our ambassador and it was on 9-11. So I want you to take us back to the beginning. For people who don't know this job, you know, contractors, I mean, how do, how do you explain it to them? Private security contractors. And for us, it was protection. It was protecting CIA case officers overseas, doing low profile protection. How did the hierarchy work here? Well, you have the chief of base. He's the, the main guy who's in charge. And then you have our- Now, that was Bob? Yes. yes. And then you have uh, the, the team lead which would be in charge of us. You know, our team leader is a staffer. He's, he's an employee for the agency, and then all us contractors are like, uh, if you talk it military-wise, we're like the enlisted folks. Other members of your team are not here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Tyrone Woods, yeah. who you called Roan. There are two other members uh, who remain anonymous, yes, right? Uh, correct. Jack and DB. Correct, mm -hmm. yes. So. You were set up to protect the annex, which was the CIA. The, per the personnel at the annex, yes. This is, gives us a perspective of the other facility there, which was what you guys call the consulate. Where are we here? Here's the, here's the consulate, yeah, here's and then here's us. Place. Here's our compound. So pretty close, about? I, three quarters of a mile as a crow flies, about a, I'd say, 
mile drive. If maybe maybe a mile, eh, if if you did the whole thing. So this site, was it well protected? Ooh, who wants to take that one? No, it looked nice. It was a beautiful compound. I mean, it had um, <laughs> orchards. It was had a Swim really nice uh, had a house. Nice had a swimming had a nice pool. pool. They had their own security. They they were their own security. They were their own yeah. Diplomatic security. The, the diplomatic, diplomatic security. security. They security, yes. didn't have a they didn't have like an American force like a Marine detachment. They they did it themselves. So what'd you tell them? And me and my bluntness. I said you know if you guys get attacked, you guys are gonna die. You know that right? And I remember I said uh, if you ever need us, you just call us. We'll come get you. What's your reaction when you hear ambassadors coming uh, to Benghazi on September 10th, September 11th, of all days? And they were like thinking, you know, there's only five guys to protect him, and that's a huge compound. All right, so 9-11 comes. Mm -hmm. Pretty routine day, it yeah. sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, it during was. the day? It's yep. pretty, it was just actually a normal. normal day, just doing normal task stuff, task organization stuff. You had a move late, yeah. I guess it was late in the afternoon? or Late early afternoon, evening. early evening. Well, uh, went out to meet some people for dinner. Normal night. Town looked normal. There was nothing that looked any different than any other day. And there was no whisper that this no. video was a major problem in Benghazi Did, or something? Didn't know about video until I got to Germany. No idea about any, any video. No. No, sir. All right, so how do you hear that something's wrong? Our team leader, he actually came across the radio, and, and I remember... I looked at my watch and it was 9.32 when I got the call, first got the call on the radio that said, hey, you know, we need all GRS. GRS? What yes. is that? GRS operators? Global response staff. Global response staff. Yep. And I remember I looked at DB and said, hey, something's going on. We're going to do something tonight. Just grabbed my stuff, threw my shoes on and started moving to the, moving to our team room. Where were you? Myself and Jack were in building D. Mm -hmm. I was just getting undressed, getting ready to go to bed. Um, I meet the TL about halfway, about right there, and I said, hey, man, what's, what's happening? And he goes, a consulate center attack. You can start hearing the fire, the, the actual concentration of fire and some explosions. It was a relatively quiet night in Benghazi, and by 9 o'clock, the seven Americans in the compound are settling down for the night. You've got the ambassador in his room writing in his diary. You've got Sean Smith, the communications expert, uh, online talking with a friend. And you've got five diplomatic security agents. Somewhere around 30 or 40 minutes later, men stream onto the compound, bearing AK-47s, chanting in Arabic, shooting off their guns. Almost instantly, they've overrun the compound. The 17 February militiamen who were supposed to be guarding the compound, they just flee. Now, you're ready to go. Five minutes, we're ready. Thumbs up, thumbs up, we're ready to go. Then what happens? I went up to the TL and I said, hey, we're ready to go. Bob looks right through me and looks at the team leader and goes, you guys need to wait. He's, just on, the, he's, on, the he's on the phone talking the phone. to somebody. I assumed that they were trying to coordinate us to link up with 17 February. Which is the local which militia. Which is the local militia. It had probably been 15 minutes, I think, and I got out of the car, and uh, Bob and uh, the team lead were standing on the front porch, and I just said, hey, you know, we gotta, we need to get over there, we're losing the initiative, you know, and Bob just looked straight at me and said, stand down, you need to wait. We're starting yeah. to get calls from the State Department guys saying, hey, we're taking fire, we need you guys here, we need help. Yeah, we're we were talking like, about like, it in the cars. What the hell is going, on? The hell's going go. on? Why are we waiting? Ambassador Stevens and Sean Smith are forced to take refuge in a specially protected area, the safe haven inside the villa. With them is Scott Wickland, a security agent charged with protecting the ambassador. They hide behind a locked gate. Wickland waits in the shadows with a rifle, ready to shoot anyone who tries to enter. The attackers can't get in, but use nearby diesel fuel to set the villa on fire. From beginning 